Price. That's the number one technical indicator. You do best by investing for the longer term. If you can't explain what the business is doing, then that is a huge red flag. Some technological change is going to put you out of business. It really is a genuinely extraordinary situation. Welcome back. I'm Hayden Brain, and you're listening to Opto Sessions, where we interview the top traders and investors from around the world, uncovering their secrets to success. Ross Gerber is one of the most influential investors on social and traditional media. With over 164,000 followers on Twitter, Gerber's candid insight has seen him become a regular on Bloomberg, Reuters, Yahoo Finance, CNN, and Forbes. His wealth and investment management firm, Gerber Kawasaki, was founded in 2010 with business partner Danilo Kawasaki and now looks after 8,000 clients and over $2 billion in AUM. We discuss the firm's unique approach to wealth management, identifying the nine themes that govern GK's investment strategy. From things that used to be illegal to pets live like humans, Ross explains the megatrends he's backing for long-term growth, all of which are captured in the company's new ETF. Enjoy the interview. Welcome to the podcast, Ross. Uh, it's great to have you on the show. So how's your week been so far? Uh, good. Thanks for having me. I, you know, my week's been pretty good. You know, lately, uh, it's summer here, so it's kind of my favorite time of the year. But uh, we've been so busy. It's been sort of a challenge to, you know, balance uh, work, enjoying, you know, really the best time of year to live here in LA and Santa Monica. But but we've been very fortunate over the last couple of years in that our business model and the way we do business with our clients has become, you know, super in demand. Um, and people care about investing in the stock market and people care about their finances, making money on crypto and, and all these things all at the same time has been sort of a boon for our company. And, you know, going back a year and a half, I was in the mindset we were going to go through one of the hardest times since the, you know, great financial crisis. And uh, so I'm, I'm in a pretty good mood because it turned out out of all this, hardship we're all facing globally, economically, it hasn't been a hardship, you know, for most people actually in America. Um, Despite what you read, most people are doing pretty well. Yeah, great. Um, I I think it's the same in the UK, um, or at least it is now. We'll see how that sort of pans out over the next five or 10 years. Um, But interesting, you mentioned that it's your favorite time of year. I suppose summer in LA is is a fantastic time to be there uh, in terms of the weather. We're having a pretty typical English summer, uh, whereas it's been raining every day for the past week or so. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. it's not freezing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I'd like to start by asking a question that, that won't necessarily flow sort of chronologically, but it will give listeners a, a, an early indication of one of the focuses of today's interview. So what, in your view, separates Gerber Kawasaki's investment philosophy from that of your peers, do you think? Well, it depends which peers you're comparing it to because some of our peers are similar to us and many of our peers are not. Um, you know, I just got a client from UBS recently and they had a lot of decent assets in their portfolio and they weren't happy with their performance over the last five years relative to a more growth focused portfolio. And so I think one of the things that separates our philosophy of investing from many of our peers is really thinking longer term um, and having a vision of where we see the world going. Not that I think I can predict the future because I definitely can't. And I always say the one thing I'm sure about is my January prediction will be completely wrong. Um, I'm sure of that. You know, like whatever I think in January, I'm sure will not be the same in December. And I think That also characterizes our differences is I'm not wedded to philosophies that then I won't change when I'm proven wrong. You know, um, I'm very flexible in the way, you know, even two months ago, we were aggressively investing on the reopening trade. And and now with Delta coming back, I mean, I can't deny the data that it's going to affect my hotels in Vegas. It's going to affect my Disneyland. And I had to trim some of my investments as I was like super bullish like two months ago. And now I'm less so bullish on the reopening trade and I'm back to being bullish on the tech trade again. 
um, as nobody's going back to the office, maybe ever again, you know, um, because everybody's planning to go. I've been in the office, you know, this whole time, you know, we're the only ones I go to empty building and then the building next door is them because Activision moved out. So, so we're very, I'm very, I'm very flexible. Yeah. I guess we would say in that looking at things that I might believe might be wrong and then making adjustments to that, you know, ho- hopefully rapidly. So I'm an active manager. So that's one philosophy that I think is very different than I think a lot of people in the investment business that have, you know, just thrown in the towel to passive investing and will accept 10% return on the S&P for the rest of their lives. But they haven't figured out that, you know, quite frankly, that's not quite good enough if you really want to get to your financial goals. Um, and so by focusing on growth, focusing on what we consider a vision of the future that I don't think is unobvious, like climate change is one of our biggest trades right now. It's 15% of our portfolio and growing our climate-related investments, looking at a battery company today. Um, I think if you don't get, when the UN puts out a thing that says we're all going to die soon if we don't deal with climate, and you don't get that from an investment thesis perspective, and you're still buying oil companies, and you're still buying big auto, and you're still buying you know this, this past, oh, well, yeah, of course, we're going to have oil in the future, but is this a growth business? No. It's going to be a shrinking business for the rest of eternity. And so oil is the best performing sector. They're like, oh, you're trailing the S&P. Well, oil is the best performing sector in the S&P this year, but it was the worst performing for two years in a row. So over three years, we're killing the S&P, right? So like to me, if you're investing in oil right now, you just don't get it. You just don't, like you're, you're kind of stupid, you know? And like, so if you're not investing in solar, if you're not investing in battery technology, you're not investing in Tesla, if you're not investing in the companies that are pushing this change where it's profitable, I'm not saying these are money losing. These are profitable businesses that are growing. You're missing the boat. And so I think a lot of firms have conflicts of interest. I think a lot of firms would rather be wedded to 20th century mentalities than 21st century mentalities because the people working there are from the 20th century, you know? So that's the difference. That's a big difference. Yeah. Everybody in my firm is from the 21st century, pretty much. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's important, particularly for the outlook. And flexibility is massively important in today's market environment. I don't think you can survive yeah, without it. For sure. Um, and speed. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Reacting quickly, uh, massively important. So, I mean, there's a couple of things, particularly on the investment theme side of things, I want to get into later on in the interview. But let's take it back to the beginning, just to understand sort of your current role, where you're at now, as well as the firm's background. I want to dig into that a little bit as well. Um, And I read that your passion for investing, I think on your website, started uh, as a 13-year-old, so pretty early, early, earlier than most, Yeah. uh, having received some Apple and Disney stock as a birthday gift. So firstly, did you keep hold of those shares? Yeah. Yeah, I did. And I still have them. And, and, you know, that's one of the things I say to people is there's nobody you probably have met who's owned Apple and Disney as long as me. Mm. And, and, you know, when they put me on TV to talk about these things, I'm like, trust me, you know, I pretty much have this, you know, stock in my head since, since I learned how to play with like little green army men, because we didn't have, you know, we didn't actually have the internet. I had to explain to my kids the other day, because they were like, dad, what did you do as a kid with no internet? You know? Mm. And I was like, I played guitar and skateboarding, you know, and, you know, it's the same thing your dad's doing right now, you know? Mm. Uh, And they were like, wow, dad, should we go play guitar and skateboard? I was like, yeah, you should probably put down the Roblox. Mm. Um, So when I was a kid, I I was lucky enough. My grandfather was an investor and my mom also, but really my grandfather. And so, uh, you know, I was curious why my grandfather was retired and spending time with us where my dad, you know, works, still works, you know, like 12 hours a day as a dentist. And it didn't seem attractive to me relative to being retired. So I was like, grandpa, you know, like, how do you do this? And he said, you know, son, I have these things called stocks and, and they pay dividends. And, and he would show me these checks because in the old days, they send you a check, mm-hmm. you know, in the mail. They still probably do if you want it um, for each company. And my grandfather would go to the mailbox and like pick up these checks every month. And I was like, this is, I'm sold, yeah. you know, like. <laughs> I don't want to be a dentist at all. You know, like this is not fun. Um, Although I, you know, really respect what my dad does. It's, it wasn't my dream. Mm. And um, 
So he said, don't go in this drawer, never touch anything in this drawer. It's all important. So of course, as a kid, that was the first place <laughs> I went. And you know, I was like opening up these drawers and seeing stock certificates. See, most people at my firm have never seen a stock certificate. So we keep one here just so it's like, hey, kids, these pieces of paper were what we traded, you know, because mm-hmm. um, now it's just a digital thing, you know, and uh, it's a Bitcoin now. And so, um, so like, I was fascinated with this idea of, and I hate to say it, I'm from the slacker generation. So like, I was like, if I can make money without work, just being smart, like that's, that was appealing to me because I was a musician. So I play music and I have a music business and, and I love music, but I realized as a kid, this is not a way to make money. Probably the smartest thing I did as a kid was not pursue music economic, you know? Like I kept playing music, but I was like, there's no way I'll survive. Like, especially the lifestyle I grew up in, because I grew up pretty well off, you know, like I was like, dude, I I don't want to pour that long. So I was poor for like two years when I graduated from college and I hated it. You know, I I had a little apartment. And so investing was a way for me to make money. And so when I, when, when 94, when I graduated college, I realized that it was the tech boom. Mm-hmm. And I started working at Disney, actually. That was my first job, too, ironically. Oh, wow. Mike Eisner hired me. Yeah, because I wrote a letter to Disney. I was like, I've been a shareholder since I was 13. Mm-hmm. I want to work at Hollywood Records, which was their you know, record company. And they sent me back this thing saying, you know, sorry, son, we don't hire anybody. And then I sent them, you know, Mike Eisner a letter. I said, Mike, I'm going to UPenn. You know, I'm a comm major, Annenberg. I know what I'm doing, you know. Mm-hmm. And then I've like called the secretary, his secretary. This is a real story. And I was like, can you put this letter on his desk? So he sees it. I schmoozed her. Wow. You know, it was like uh, All Street, the movie. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Like, like I'm schmoozing the secretary, you know? <laughs> and so she does this. She gives Mike Eisner the letter. Mike Eisner gives the head of Disney hiring or whatever. And they call me the next day. Say, they flew me out. We want to, you know, interview, hire me, put me in Hollywood Records. And basically I learned my first big lesson about big companies is, you rush around to do nothing. And so I got to Hollywood Records and nothing was happening. The company was all messed up. And they're like, oh, just sit here for a couple months until we figure out what we're going to do. And I was like, this is not my dream. You know, I thought we were going to make albums and this and that. So I went from record company to record company. And I, and I realized at Atlantic Records that Napster was going to destroy the music industry. I just, it hit me that day. Mm-hmm. And I was like, these people have no idea what they're doing. Like it was, they're, the people in the industry were so untech savvy that I knew the music industry would be destroyed, which I was right. And I actually had a proposal for an online music company and, and they laughed at me, which I should have maybe followed through with because I would have done Spotify before them. But, um, but then I got into investing. So I found a company called Sun America and Sun America was run by this guy, Eli Broad, and they were doing retirement planning and they were hiring people. They had a training program to get you licensed and sell retirement plans to people because everybody's getting old, right? Mm-hmm. And so I got into this business at 23 years old, uh, basically knocking on doors, selling retirement plans to people and, and mutual funds and, and annuities. And it was the beginning of the 90s. And I was the only guy with a laptop. And I started buying stocks and I started buying tech stocks. And one morning I woke up and I said, one day, every single person will have a computer on their desk. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to invest in computers. And so I got in the investment business in the 90s. and I was a multi, I was a multimillionaire by the time I was 28. It was it was great. It was just I was super wow. lucky. You know, I'd like to say I, I had amazing skills and all this great stuff, but I was super lucky. The timing was great. My vision of it at that time I thought wasn't that surprising that we were all going to use AOL and get on the internet and buy a PC. Like it just seemed obvious. Mm-hmm. So that's what I invested in and and our fir- my first five years were amazing. It was it was really an amazing time, 94 to 99. I was at the exchange in 99 during the AOL Time Warner merger at the top of the market back before the computers had taken over. And it was just, I was like, this is the best business in the world. <laughs> that was the top. That was the top. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the next 10 years sucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean... Luck and timing are important, I suppose, but you obviously had the nose for this stuff. I mean, with the Spotify example, um, and then, you know, you're the only guy with the laptop realizing that everyone's going to have these on their desk in the next 10 years. I mean, where do you think that? I'm the only guy with a Bitcoin now in my industry. I'm the only guy selling Bitcoin to people 
And trust me, in 10 years, everybody's going to have Bitcoin. Well, you know? So, so where, where does that come from? Where does that kind of uh, insight and nose for this sort of stuff come from? Can you teach that or is that? Yeah, you know, I, I would say to my wife, I don't think that I'm a visionary. Like, I think I see the obvious. Like, you know, I do a lot of stuff with Elon. Mm-hmm. And when I'm with Elon, well, not with him, when I'm dealing with Elon, there's always stuff with him that's so far beyond what you think. Mm. Like, you think you understand what he's doing. And then, you know, you dig a little deeper and you realize like, dude, this guy's thinking way past what everybody else is thinking. You know, that's why I've made so much money with Elon was Mm -hmm. I get it. I don't know what he's going to do, but Mm -hmm. I get he's a vision. You know what I mean? Like the way he sees the world and what he's trying to accomplish Mm -hmm. in his life is insane. And it's beyond what I can quantify. So I just invest, you know, like I don't need to look at mm-hmm. numbers. You know, it's like, it's, you don't get it if you don't get Elon. I'm not Elon. Mm-hmm. The way I look at it is I look at what I think is obvious. Things that seem like there's no other path but this. But I'm willing to invest heavily in it. And so, like, Mm -hmm. I believe every decade we have these trends. We just have these trends and they're happening right now. They're obvious, like healthcare, like the coronavirus is not an accident. We've been negligent in the way we've treated healthcare and our systems for long periods of time. And a little virus comes around that now spreads across the world and humans are so damn stupid, we can't get together and cure it. It's curable. It's solvable. But we just can't get together and fix this. Even in my country or your country, where half the people believe one thing and half the people believe the other, and nobody seems to want to work together, even though we all benefit. So, so like investing in healthcare and vaccines, and, and you know, like the few, the next five years, we're going to be dealing with mm. all kinds of healthcare issues, aging populations, and this and that. So, to me, it's obvious. My parents are in the hospital every day for some. The coronavirus, the least of their issues, uh, along with like every other medical issue as our entire society ages. So our entire society, Western civilization Mm. is old. Okay. So like, it's obvious to me Mm. that Corona exposed the amazing lack of investment that for profit Mm. hospitals had in infrastructure to serve the people who might really need the services. And now again, here in United States and many states that are ignorant about coronavirus are now overrun again, overrun with hospitals. So like investing in healthcare and biotech and the breakthroughs we've seen in biotech, mm. it's obvious. To yeah. me. It's obvious. We're going to have amazing breakthroughs in the next decade in medicine. And we will solve corona and we will solve maybe cancer. And if we can solve cancer, which seems solvable relative to mRNA technology and like I'm not an expert in this technology, but I get it. And I'm like, dude, if this stuff, they keep working on this stuff, these geniuses, we're going to solve some of these low-level cancers. We're going to start solving Mm -hmm. genetic mutations. What's happening in genetics is insanely cool. And it's not even my thing, but I get it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, completely. Um, You don't need to understand the specifics of it, I suppose. You need to understand there's a problem there to solve and people are working to solve it. And and there's a big economic upside to solving the problem. Not just that there's a problem to solve. You know, we got to solve homelessness, but there's only upside to, you know, developers who are paying off the city or whatever. But like, there's no upside to me. Mm -hmm. But when you think about investing in healthcare, there's upside to society and it's upside for profit. So, you know, if the Mm -hmm. government will waste tens of billions of dollars on wars and stupid sh- stuff, you know, you, you sort of say, well, investing mm. in healthcare is a no-brainer. Pays off 100% of the time, yeah. right? Um, so, so to yeah. me, climate, healthcare, for example, technology, which has always been an area we've invested in where there's change, it just changes where there's change, right? Um, these mm. sectors are obvious to me. Some of the more obvious ones are like pet care, which is an area we invest in. Like the pet industry is mm-hmm. boom in the United States. People have lost their minds when it comes to pets. Now, I'm not sure if that's the case in England, but they've lost their minds here. Okay. So, no, I, I think it's absolutely the case in England. I, you see pet ownership and adoption has soared in, in the UK. People have got crazy. more time on their hands. They're working But not just home. that. They want pets around. They, they got gloves for the yeah. paws. They got clothes. Yeah. 
They got they got fresh delivery food. You got like fresh yeah. meat. You know, you got. I mean, your dog has like some problem with his arm. They have like arm surgery for the dog now. And if your dog's got a limp, they've got a special like wheelchair. I'm like, wow. I think these people are crazy, but I'm certainly willing to profit off. You know, yeah. I'm like, it's your pet. You know, people get mad at me. I go, it's a dog. And they're like, why are you talking down to my dog? I'm like, because it is a dog. You know, yeah. it's a dog. Well, that's um, so we picked three themes of the nine that uh, your firm track uh, that I want to dig into. And that's one of them because that's one of the ones that I'm, you know, I, I can see the investment potential. But in terms of why people are so crazy about their pets, it's, it's something that I struggle to empathize with. So I'm probably on the same page as you there. Oh, I, I can explain it simply. I can explain that simply. Okay, well, let, let's get to that in a bit. I want to just go back to your career trajectory, just to kind of round off the circle and, and kind of work out like why you started uh, Gerber Kawasaki. I mean, you founded the business, I think, back in May 2010, right, with uh, your business partner. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So the financial crisis came around and everything we were doing got wiped out. So we were part of AIG because Sun America got bought by AIG. So I was yeah. on like ground floor of the Titanic and being ground floor of the Titanic right. taught us some very important lessons, mm -hmm. which is why were we on the Titanic in the first place? We thought it was a good ship. AIG was a AAA rated Dow stock. You know, we used to be pleased we were part of, we were AIG financial advisor um, until that ended. Um, and when it ended, my partner and I, more so me in that, because I was actually running the company I was running at that time and my partner was was working with me but it was ultimately me who had to deal with the nightmare of the financial crisis which involved me having mm -hmm. to shut about 40% of my company fire about 40% of my company at the time it wasn't really my company it was the company I was running um and it was a horrible experience like i i get ptsd watching some of these movies like i literally do i can't watch it i just i can't watch it it's it's that it was that difficult a time, and I lost all my money, you know, other than like fifty grand, and my house burned down. So it was like, <laughs> yeah, you know, it was like the low. It was the low of my financial life, December '08, and it was the week I I met my wife, which is the craziest thing. Which was December uh, '08 when I met my wife at the when my house caught on fire. The week my house caught on fire. Oh my God! Thank God for the firemen saved my house, but. But I was like, compared to today, I, I was at a low point. Uh, the I was like, the financial system's ending. My, I have no money left. And so when we, you know, I was able to hold on because I didn't have debt. You know, I'm like, I'm, I had a couple properties. I lost the properties. I learned a lot about real estate and how shitty it is. And then I said to myself, okay, like the whole industry's over. Like, we are going to do this the, a new way. And we're going to start a new company. I'm not going to have 15 offices all over the country like Charles Schwab or whatever, because it was our goal to have offices all over the country, bricks and mortar. I was done with bricks and mortar. And we were the first firm on Facebook. So we had already started using social media. So when the financial crisis happened, actually, they fired all the compliance people who were stopping us from using social media. And so we just started using Facebook. And we got like 30,000 fans on Facebook like really quickly in like 08, 09, before I started my firm. And so like when we started our firm, we were still a part of AIG from a broker dealer perspective because we hadn't escaped yet to LPL, which thank God we did. And, um, but we had to, it was just like this whole deal. And then like, so, so like the compliance people were like non-existent. So we started posting on social media. So I started a firm and I was like, we're going to use uh, technology. So so my my roommate from college was a tech guy. So he was living in Hawaii programming. And I, I flew to Hawaii and I was like, dude, we were on Kapalua, actually, a beautiful day hitting golf balls. I was like, you're gonna you're gonna leave all this and you're gonna move to LA and we're gonna build a company, but I need a tech person because it's a finance company, but we need technology to because we're gonna build websites, we're gonna build all kinds of stuff, apps, we're gonna build stuff. And he left. He he came to LA from Jeff did, and he got a part of the company, and and you know, took took a reasonable pay to to work with us, and 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 fortunately that's worked out for him. But like you know, and I love Jeff, and he's still a, a major. He's the CTO of the company. Um, 
a major part of the company. But like, I had my partner Danilo, and then I had Jeff on board, and we were like, we're going to build an online financial planning company where we serve the public, but we actually have human beings providing the advice. It's not a solution like where we are a robot, but we're going to reach our audience and be mobile using laptops to see clients versus opening offices all over the country. Because I was so sick of flying around and doing meetings and it was like a nightmare. I was like, I'm never doing this again. So we're just have one office. And plus we could have all our managers in the same location versus like, so I was like all virtual. So they tried to stop us. And then this woman from AIG was hired to be head of compliance as they were rebuilding the company. And she was like, I see what you're doing. And you're probably expecting me to tell you to stop doing it. But actually FINRA is starting a pilot program for social media. And we want you guys to be it. And here's what you have to do, which was basically pre-approve every post. We were going to set the standards for laws in FINRA and what should and shouldn't be done on social media. And so we we were a part of that program and I think it was 2010. And, and we've been actually leaders in getting so many social platforms approved to be used by FINRA and the SEC because we just started using them and then made our... And the way we did it was in a way that when the regulators came to us, we were like, here are the rules that we've put in place to protect the public. And that's why we've never gotten in trouble because even now that we're doing Bitcoin, We've, all, we've spent a fortune of time and money on rules. Like if you want to open a Bitcoin account with us, it's just like opening every other investment account, AML, SEC rules, everything. So like we've created a standard now for investment firms that want to open up Bitcoin accounts for clients. We've created a standard. And, and if the SEC comes, they'll hopefully be like, wow, that's awesome. You actually have policies and procedures for all this, where all the rest of the firms have no idea what you know, and so I think we've always approached things like, yeah, we're going to be first at doing this, but we're going to do it within the framework of what makes sense from a legal perspective and, and protecting clients and protecting customers is always the first goal of the SEC. So we've always focused on doing what's best for clients. And, and because of that, it's, it's been a huge success for us in building our business. So, so being an online work with everybody firm. Um, ended up being a great idea over the last 10 years. And we've grown from, we had about 30 million in assets when we started, which was mostly my clients. Um, and now we're over 2 billion in assets. Um, and we're growing right now at twice the rate I actually predicted, which I'm really happy about uh, a, a year ago. Yeah. So we're, we're take, we take in about $10 million every week now. So we're on a run rate of over a half a billion a year in revenue. Uh, in new sales and and you know we're just growing at forty or fifty percent a year. So so I'm really really pleased with the business and and now everybody's online and now everybody wants financial advice and and we're one of the solutions that anybody no matter what your background and even if you're in England that's the coolest part. We now have an agreement to do business all throughout the world with Vontobel Securities. So if you're an English investor, you can work with us through Vontobel. Um, or you, now we have the ETF we launched. So if your platform in England. Uh, allows trading on New York Stock Exchange stocks, you can actually buy our ETF. So we're a global firm. Um, that was our goal is if you're French or British or German or Asian or, or from Brazil or whatever, we can work with you and we have either a product you can buy or we can provide services as well. All through online. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that seems crucial to everything. So you don't did. ask about the international law. No, no, absolutely not. I, technology is sort of key to to your offering. I mean, uh, as you say, you work from one building um, by and large. And actually, it seems like that's, I guess, crucial to the target market you're going after as well. You you tend, at least from what I read on your website, to focus on kind of the younger generations, perhaps Gen Xers, millennials, with some baby boomers in there as, as well, I'd, I'd expect. We, we work with distinctly three groups. People with money pay the bills. There's no question. A, a lot of these people didn't start that way with us. You see what I'm saying? Um, some do. Some are people coming from UBS or you know high net worth clients that are tired of wirehouses. Fine. We love that business and, and they're happy to, to work with us. But our, our, our main business is what we would like to call our get invested or wealth building program, where we have thousands of young people who've never invested before. And we teach you how to invest and save. And we don't make money off that. We charge costs basically. 
But we know that the more clients we get, the more referrals we get, oftentimes to their parents, brothers and sisters, whatever. But many of these young people have jobs, let's say in technology or finance or law or whatever. And just because they're 25 and this is their first investment doesn't mean when they're 30, they're not going to be making more money and now want to do more. And that's what happens. So then they graduate what we call our wealth management program when they have 250000 in assets. Then we provide more services, uh, more specific stock picking and, and things like that. Um, and as they get married, we do life insurance, we do tax and accounting now. So we help you. And then as you get older, unfortunately, this happens. It happens to me now. You know, you get older. Now I'm 50 and my goals are different. I'm trying to put my kids through school. And I'm thinking about having financial independence. And so, you know, and and I'm making the most amount of money I've ever made. So this is the ideal time in our mind. So our target client is actually like a Gen Xer, really, not a baby boomer. So our client base is basically Gen X and, and millennials who are now in prime earning years. But because we started 10 years ago when those millennials were 23, they all love us. And that's the the secret is we get referrals from all of our clients because we work with them when they didn't have any money. Okay. And so we have this kind of relationship with people that they appreciate the time that we put into them when they didn't have any money. Because now that they have money, part of it is because they had our help and they've saved and invested correctly. And we've had a wonderful decade in investing. And so it's like, you know, who wouldn't want to do that? Right. Like, I mean, who wants to struggle with money? I mean, Young people are really into experiencing life and they want to have fun. And I get it. Okay. They lived with their moms till they were like 30 and now they're out and they're getting married and they having kids and they want to experience life. And part of that is having financial independence. And that's why there's this massive desire for information. And that's the second reason we're successful is we put all the information out. We put it all out on Twitter. We put it all out on YouTube. We, there's no hidden secrets here. Everybody knows what we're buying and selling. Now with the ETF, you can see it daily. We don't hide anything. There's no secret. There's no, you know, like, oh, they have this secret formula for making money in the stock market or something, you know? And so I put it all out there on Twitter every day. You know, Moderna's down today. Moderna's up today. We own Moderna. This is why, you know, um, and I think people want to learn. And so when you educate people and you empower people, you have more success. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a completely underserved sort of segment of the market in the UK, particularly. We're having a lot of problems with millennials actually not even having the financial literacy to yeah. work towards financial independence, let alone then actually understanding the solutions being presented to them by certain companies. So, right. so I think what you're doing is extremely commendable, actually. Um, and obviously, if it works business-wise, then 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 that's obviously good as well. (laughs) Yeah, it works business-wise. But like the way I look at it is just from my own experience and the experience of everybody we've hired here, who mostly we hire out of college. Mm. I would never be as wealthy today as I am if I didn't start investing when I was 13 or 23. You know, when I started making money, I started saving and investing money. Mm. So we know there's no like get rich quick method. Exactly. And so we don't teach that. What we teach is you're 25 years old, start saving a hundred bucks a month, you know, put it away in, in, in some tech stocks, put it away in Tesla. It works out real well when you wake up 10, 15 years from now, but you got time on your side. That's power. So I actually really don't like getting clients who are my age, who really haven't started saving, who make a million dollars a year, mm-hmm. but they're like, Ross, I need to have a 10 million or $20 million asset base in 15 or 20 years. And I got kids to pay for in this that. And I'm trying to teach these people how to budget at 50 years old. Mm. It's it's no fun. Nah. It's no fun. So if I can get you when you're 25 and teach you the right habits, you're going to be an amazing client at 50. You know what I mean? And that's been the case. That's, that's how it works out. We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now back to the show. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Well, let's move on to the uh, GK's investment approach. Now, we mentioned the ETF, which I think we can get into here as well. Um, Your portfolio consists of companies positioned to benefit from transformative societal shifts, is the way I read it on your website. And I think think that's um, a really interesting investment approach. And as I said earlier, you focus on nine investment themes. 
three of which I'm going to ask questions about in a second. But before I do, why did GK uh, employ a thematic investment approach? What's the reason for taking that method? Uh, so I've, I've been a professional for 28 years. And for a long time, the way I did it, I never methodically like thought it out. You know, like I just was a stock pick. So like I've been a stock trader my whole life. So like for me, like I kind of live and breathe markets. Like I, it's, it wasn't a choice. You know, it's not like I, it's more a burden than, you know, so, so it's a lonely world when you kind of live and breathe the stocks and at least people care about it now. Nobody cared about it five years ago. So I would just live in my only lonely little world of the stock market. And I never really thought out why I was doing what I was doing in a methodical way. And then as the firm grew and we were doing well, everybody at the firm, was co- we copy the same investment approach with all our clients. It's not like every advisor does a different thing and picks different stocks. We work together. So we started working more together and two things happened. One was quantitative analysis became much more uh, successful and, and popular and the data and computers got good enough that there was a level of analysis of what we were doing that I had never seen before. And it started with this program called Aladdin, which is part of BlackRock's portfolio management system. And Aladdin's like the most complex formula, you know, portfolio analyzer ever yeah. created. I don't know. <laughs> this thing is awesome. So I ran my portfolio through this thing and it spit out like an 82 page thing. And you have to like go to a class just to understand, <laughs> you know, like what's Aladdin yeah. teaching you. And it sort of was like, okay, here's the plus and the minus back testing this and that. But in the end, it kind of spit out. It was like, wow, you yeah. guys build really cool stuff. Like, how are you doing this? Like, what's the method? And then I realized that my method was basically me picking stocks. And I hadn't really thought on a macro level enough and a data level. Enough. And so, so we started using data. Then we started having more group meetings of investment. Mm-hmm. So I would have more of a check and balance to my ideas versus trial and error, which was kind of the way I did it before. Or I'd buy five stocks and the three that went down, I just sell. And the two that go up, you know, I keep and add to, you know, the trial and error approach where I'll find five ideas and add them and then sell. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to manage money and scale this way. So to manage your own portfolio this way, it's easy. But to manage money and scale with thousands of clients, it was like, oh my God, how do we scale your ideas, Ross? Oh, yeah. you know. So then it occurred to me that I was going to have to change. And so we added the group, which was really helpful in countering my bad ideas. Um, so groupthink does work, especially when you have a bad idea. Being questioned is a really important part of the investment process. So I have very little ego yeah. to being wrong or right. You see what I'm saying? You can't be, I'm so smart when I'm right, and I'm so dumb mm-hmm. when I'm wrong. You know what I mean? Like That's a tough way to live. <laughs> So when I'm right, I, I, I'm real happy, but I try to temper yeah. that, you know, and when I'm wrong, I'm, I'm depressed, but I try to temper that too. But I have a team now. So we yeah. have a process yeah. that's very painful in some ways mm. for me and for them sometimes too, because they have to come up against me and it's not adversarial. It's meant to be productive, like debate, but every two weeks mm. we fight it out, you know? And like, if they really have a dumb idea, I tell them their ideas are dumb. And if they think my idea is dumb, they'll tell them it's dumb in nicer yeah. terms, but like, and yeah. then we'll fight it out. And there's a pro that process made me better. You know, mm-hmm. like it's kind of like why we get married. I think, you know, it's like my wife constantly reminds me that I could be a better person, you know, and she's probably mm-hmm. right. You know, <laughs> like, um, so if I didn't believe she was right, I'd get divorced, but She's probably right. So I, I listen to her you now. And, and so I think we're better people when we are willing to listen to things that are painful, because I'm not going to lie and say that they're not painful sometimes because we all like to think we're smart and perfect, but we're not. And uh, so that process helped a lot. So we quantify the process and then we, we made it like into a model. Like, so like we had to manage money and scale. But then we realized like if we're going to make changes, each change was like yeah. such a big deal. And that kind of right. led to the ETF because that was being able to make changes scale now versus manually, which is real painful. Um, but I, I'm, our process got better and I realized these aren't just like random stocks. Like 
And then through my thinking, I realized like I was really honing in on certain ideas and investing around those ideas. And, and through that, I sort of got to the point where like, these are this. So then like Kathy Wood and all them got really popular because we had worked together with Tesla and then she was, her firm was just a little bit bigger than mine. And like, we both did really well with Tesla, except she was like a public ETF and I was like a private firm. So they were able to take in way more assets than us in scale because we have to work with each client, you know? And, um, and, and Kathy's marketing evolved very well, you know, and we kind of worked together and I was like, boy, she's really like articulating their approach in a way that is very similar to ours. And I liked it. And so that's why thematic investing. So we work with like Global X and then I was working with the Round Hill guys, which are also thematic investors. And so once they started putting out thematic pieces, I was like, yeah, you know, that's basically what we do, you know? So that's how it's all evolved now into, you know, sort of one cohesive story. Yeah. And, and that strategy, that approach manifests itself now in an ETF, as you say, that's in partnership right. with advisor shares. Firstly, how did that come about? Did they approach you? Did you approach them? Yeah. Um, it came about because I'm not actually sure why they approached me. I think it was because the ETF business is really a marketing business. You know, there's like 10 million yeah. ETFs and there's like 3,000 stocks. So like there's like 50 ETFs a day being made. And so I didn't really understand why this was. And it was like, oh, because market makers make a lot of money on ETFs and it's very profitable business for Wall Street and it revolves around marketing. So essentially like most ETF companies spend the majority of their money on marketing because how, how else would anybody even hear mm -hmm. of it? And they've used novel yeah. approaches over the years. So Noah, who's the head of advisor shares, reached out because he's like, I follow you on Twitter. You're big time. You're on TV all the time. You know, you're a stock picker mm -hmm. and there's this active ETF structure. What do you know about it? And I said, I don't know much about it because nobody's doing it. And he's like, well, let me explain. Yeah. And when he got to the part about the tax part, I was sold. Okay. So most people, mm -hmm. including myself, did not understand the way ETFs really work. But there's a fluke in the rules. And the fluke is a revolving around a rule that Vanguard and BlackRock love for their passive funds, which is when they add or subtract a stock from the S&P 500, it would cause a tax consequence. And they didn't want that. So they got this rule that says, if I switch a stock for another stock, like a 1031 exchange in real estate in the US, that there's no taxes, you can defer the cost basis on them. So if you have a stock that goes up a ton in your portfolio, you can then trade it for another stock and you're not actually selling it. And then the, there's no taxable gain. And I was like, dude, I create so much taxes every year through active portfolio management. You got to be kidding me. Like this really exists. And he's like, yeah. So I looked it up because I didn't believe him. And sure enough, sure enough, this exists. So if you make a ton of money in a stock and an ETF, you can just transfer it out for another stock or a group of stocks and pay no taxes. So this tax deferred thing is a huge plus return wise. So, you know, our ETF costs 0.81 all in. But what I figured, so we track this because our clients pay these taxes, I pay these taxes, that it's usually five to 10% of a actively managed portfolio is distributed as, as a taxable gain. So in California, your taxes can be high as 35% on your capital gains. So if you're in California and, and we distribute 5% as profit, then you're paying 1.5% cost in taxes. And now with Biden's new proposal, he wants to go to 50% if you're making any real money. So I was like, if I can defer these, these capital gains taxes, my returns will go up for all of my clients and myself by anywhere from 1% to 3% just by not having to pay taxes. It's like an IRA. I was like, this is amazing. This is amazing. So the second problem we had was managing money and scale was this changing of ideas. So when, when I make a shift now, we have to shift on 18,000 accounts. Not easy. Not easy. So because we manage so many small accounts, we were like, if we have our own ETF, then I can just make the shift in the ETF and everybody will just get it that day, you know, versus us trying to do block trades through thousands of accounts. Just it's, it's like running like a nuclear warship where it's like, if you punch in one code wrong, the entire 
world explodes, you know? So it's super nerve wracking trading in 18,000 accounts, one button, you know? And, and we have like 18 procedures before we put, you know, it is like nuclear keys. Did you do it right? You know, one time we made a mistake. Okay. Yeah. It was like a $250,000 mistake. You know what I mean? Just like in one second gone <laughs> that we lost, you know? Yeah. We have insurance for that, but, but yeah. So we had, have a lot of procedure. So this ETF is super efficient. And then it allows people who follow me who don't want a financial advisor to just buy our fund. You know, that's the third reason. We have so many people who want to invest with us, but they're just not going to move their money. They're not going to leave, you know, Webull or they're not going to leave, you know, Schwab or wherever. And they they don't want a financial advisor. So they can just buy my fund. So those three reasons were pretty much it. But the real reason I went through with it was because of NOAA and advisor shares. I'm not really a fan of working with many people in the financial industry because I'm controversial and they're mostly risk adverse people. So typically financial firms are very scared of me. They like, they like me because I bring in money, but they don't like half the things I say, you know, publicly because they're controversial. And my feeling is any opinion you have is controversial if you say it because half the people aren't going to like it. So you know, if you tell me you like chocolate, there's people who like vanilla, you know, and, and you say like, I don't like vanilla, you're going to get haters. You're going to get vanilla haters, you know, and they'll be like, Ross hates vanilla. And so like a lot of CEOs are really gets stressed out when people are like, F Ross, he's a vanilla hater, you know? And I'm like, dude, I, I don't like vanilla. Sorry. I like chocolate, you know? And they'll like, they'll call you horrible things. They'll make up fake articles that you really eat vanilla ice cream at night and you lie about it. And you're some sort of scumbag vanilla hater, but you really love it. And then they'll post it on Zero Hedge and pretend like it's real, you know, and then they'll share it, you know. And so, like, a lot of CEOs are really scared of the two haters. And so they don't want any opinions. Um, my mom thought it was a really bad idea that I say all my opinions. And in some cases, she was right, <laughs> especially during the Trump period of time, because I'm an anti racist. And I absolutely abhor the direction of these evil people have tried to take America and failed, fortunately, but in, including trying to overthrow our government. Um, so, you know, like I'll talk about that and I don't care. I'll hang out with Trump supporters who aren't crazy. You know, like if you have an opinion that's different than mine, I don't necessarily dislike you unless you're racist unless you're racist, but like, you can just be a conservative. I'm fine with that. I have a lot of conservatives, you know, and I have a lot of liberal beliefs. And I think a lot of liberals are horrible. You know, some of the liberals are horrible. I was talking about having a liberal conservative party in, in the United States. We need like a middle party. It's like, you can't, you can't, you have to be one or the other. So, so Noah at advisor shares started the, the biggest cannabis ETF. And I'm a big cannabis fan and cannabis investor and an obvious theme, a, Hugely obvious theme is cannabis and the things that used to be illegal. And I was like, if this guy is going to do a cannabis ETF, which has a hundred issues, you know what I mean? He's got to be cool. And we had a talk and I said, listen, Noah, the Nazis are going to go after me and you're going to have to deal with it. And, you know, these people are going to go after me and you're going to have to deal with it. And the Tesla short sellers hate me, you know, but I got 164,000 followers too. And, you know, that's the upside. And so he, he was like, dude, I, I'm, I'm good with, it. you know, and I was like, are you sure? You know, you know, and then like, there were some incidents where I had started something and then he like got on and defended me because they were like, Noah, are you going to do business with this guy? He, he hates, you know, racists or something. And Noah's like, is there something wrong with hating racists or something? I was like, all right, this guy is my kind of guy, you know? Um, and and that's that was it. Yeah, and and in in terms of the ETF, then I mean, there's there's nine themes that you guys look at. I mean, you've mentioned a few of them so far. You've got climate change, you've got top brands consumers love, real estate disruption, healthcare and biotech innovation, amongst many others. So there's nine in total. Like, how does it work with the ETF? Are you are you trying to say it's to, to stay sorry exposed to all of those all of those nine themes at any given time? Or are you happy to divert your exposure to the most compelling companies? How, how does that kind of portfolio construction actually work? No, no, the, those nine themes. Those nine themes are like what I consider the new like S and P theme. So the S and P has ten sectors. Yeah. I think they made an eleventh or whatever. Yeah. Um, 
And I almost added a 10th because I, I'm thinking about adding crypto fintech as a separate theme from the tech because it's in tech right now. Yeah, interesting. But like, I'm super bullish in that area. And that theme is so obvious to me. Mm-hmm. So I put it in technology because it is technology to me. Mm-hmm. But I got three companies now in that area. And I'm, I'm starting to think it might warrant its own theme. But then the marketing people are like, oh, all our marketing says nine themes. I was like, well, 10's a round number, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. So it's, it's still nine. So the nine themes are always represented and that's for diversification. The allocation to those themes will change based off like now video games are sort of underperforming. So we lowered our allocation and we added to our allocation in healthcare, biotech. So I look at those, those are like, those are the nine themes. Now, if something changes, maybe I'll, I'll take one out. But those are the nine themes. And then the weightings will change. And then within those themes, what we're giving is our best ideas. These are the, the most, the ideas we have most conviction with that we feel have the most upside opportunity and are the biggest positions that we own. So it's really meant to mimic what we own for our clients. It's not like a separate fund. So many of our clients are like, why do we own the ETF? Like, what do we do? And I was like, no, no, you are the ETF. You don't need to own the ETF. The ETF is meant to mimic this exposure. The difference being I can move quicker in the ETF. And many of my clients have many constraints on what assets they can buy and sell based off what they own and taxes and all these other things. So there's some advantages to the ETF for my clients um, because we have more flexibility in that, in that tax advantage. Um, but it's really represents. So if you were a client of Gerber Kawasaki, you would have a similar portfolio than if you buy the ETF. The difference being the ETF is 100% stocks and our client portfolios are more diversified with bonds and some other types of investments. So, so we have bonds too but we don't have that in the ETF. No. And at a company level then, are there any consistent fundamentals or characteristics that you're screening for in terms of picking the yeah. actual companies that, that enter the portfolio? So the first thing I think is most important with a company is its growth rate and its growth of earnings rate. I tend to not like companies that don't make money. So I have this theory, a stock can only go up if it has zero earnings for so long because you still have zero earnings. Um, at some point, you got to have earnings if you have zero earnings and you're reinvesting cash flow and it's an accounting thing, so you got to look at cash flow, not just earnings. So there's lots of companies that don't have earnings, but they have positive cash flow and they're reinvesting it so they can mm-hmm. still gain value. So earnings and cash flow. So we kind of yeah. take a company's financial and do like our own version of it so we can strip out all the bull crap. Mm. You know, like a yeah. lot of companies don't want to count stock compensation as compensation. I don't understand how that's not compensation. Yeah. You know, it's like if you pay somebody with stock, with my stock, you know, it's right. like you're paying them, you know. So they strip it out. They go, our earnings were three dollars, but after comp, you know, Snapchat's like this. I like Snapchat, and they're doing well, but they take all the money away from shareholders. Now the stock's gone up, but they they never had an earning in their life, you know. So at a certain point, it's like you sort of like, yeah, you guys have enriched yourself plenty off of us. Um, and then the dilution comes, and the dilution comes, and whatever. Kind of like the Robin Hood. Um, I tend to not like those stocks. I tend to like companies that make profits, pay dividends, buy back stock, uh, great management, good growth rates. So the first thing we look at is the PE to growth rate. That's, I think, kind of almost like my biblical growth measurement tool. Now, you got to figure out what the real price is and what the real earnings are first. And that's where it gets trickier. But like, if a company has a 50 PE and you just assume it's expensive, that's very narrow minded because if the company is growing at 60, 70%, it's not expensive. It's cheap relative to the market. So, so look at the, the S&P is average about 10% a year and earnings for the S&P companies that average about 10% a year. So uh, if you really look over the long term, stocks go up in direct proportion to its earnings growth. Okay. So any stock you look at over, let's say 10 years, if you like chart the earnings growth and then you chart the stock price, you get this, this thing around the earnings growth. So there's times where it's overvalued relative to earnings growth, which usually means earnings growth will accelerate. And there's times it's undervalued based off its earnings growth, which usually means there's some issue that they're dealing with or whatever. But over time, that line is the line. And see, I run a business and that's different than a lot of stock people who don't run businesses. So they don't understand like, this is real money. You know? Like, it's really in a bank account, you know, like Apple really made, you know, 28 billion this quarter 
That's like in their bank account for real money. And then they choose what to do with this real money. It's not just a stock price. So like stocks will always go up if they're well-managed companies, because if they manage the capital correctly, then the stock price should always go up if they're profitable. Um, oftentimes they're bad stewards of capital doing dumb mergers and stupid things, and then the stock doesn't. But but a well-run company like Apple, where the shareholders are taken care of and they don't do stupid mergers and stuff, it's like, how does it not go up over time? You know, because they just make so much money. So so peg ratio is one of the first things we figure out. And then we want to get a real idea of what the growth rate is, what people are paying for that. And if I can get that positive working for me, um, that's really good. Our ideal stock is a stock that has rising earnings and a rising PE ratio too. So it's a stock like a home builder like Lennar. I'm really invested in Lennar right now. The home building industry is still not getting respect for being a growth industry. It's still trading at 10 and 12 PEs, like these old home building companies that never grow. Well, that was the case up until recently. But in the last couple of years, the home building industry is going off charts because Everybody left the city and said, oh, I'm tired of living in an apartment. I don't need to live in an apartment here in New York City. I can go to New Jersey, buy a house, and do my job from there. And I have a house. And my kids can run around in a yard instead of in a, in a gated you know, park with homeless people surrounding you. You know what I mean? And so people left, and they bought a house. But the problem is there aren't houses to buy. So the home builders are just ramped up. They're making a fortune. They're going up 20 30% earnings. PEs are at 10 and 12 like it's the old industry. And we're buying these stocks heavily invested in the home building sector, heavily invested in real estate right now, other than offices. And, and I'm like, you get it, earnings keep going up 20% and the PE gets to a 15 from a 10. I make a ton of money. I make a ton of money. So that's the ideal situation. If you're buying, like I bought some Coinbase and it, you know, it's growing at a huge rate, but the PE is let's say 70, you know, or whatever. Yeah, you'd be turned off. You say uh, PE seventy. It's a seventy billion dollar company. I say, yeah, you're right. It's expensive. It's you're no you're no brain surgeon figuring out Coinbase is a good stock. But if it grows like this and Bitcoin keeps doing what I think it's going to do, you're dumb not to own Coinbase in five years. You know. So I learned that lesson with a stock called Nvidia. Um, I found this company years and years and years ago, and owned it for the video game business and. And then one day they came out with this whole autonomous driving chip and it was like, wow, this is the chip Tesla was using. So I was like, wow. So there was Mobileye and NVIDIA. And I realized NVIDIA had this GPO thing cornered and the stock was trading at 50 times earning. My partner was like, it's too expensive. It's too expensive. I was like, I don't care what you say. We're buying the stock. We're buying the stock and we bought it. You know, and now look, at it. you know, we're up 20 times on the stock, you know, and it's like, mm. so if you keep growing at 50, 60% a year, and you pay 50 times earnings, trust me, it's going to work out fine. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, let's dig into just one of these themes then, because I, I realize I'm taking up a lot of your time. But one that we briefly alluded to at the start of the uh, interview was things that used to be illegal. Obviously, yeah. one of the more uh, kind of catchy names uh, and drew my attention, that's for sure. Hopefully, it will interest the listeners. So this is like cannabis, online gaming. Those are two industries that are right. represented within that theme. Are there any other themes or kind of sub-industries within that overarching theme that, that I haven't picked out? Well, first of all, England is a perfect example. You know, you guys have always had gambling on every corner. So like, I was always yeah. amazed when I went to England when I was younger, you know, you could like walk into the bar and there was like gambling at the bar and drinking. You know, <laughs> British people know how to have fun. You know, I, I, I don't love British society, part of it. You know, like I'm not into monarchies and all this kind of stuff. But like British people mm -hmm. are, know how to have fun. I mean, you go to a British party, it's the loudest party you can go to. You know, like, yeah, I love it. I love it. No, I, sure. even, seriously, wonderful people. <laughs> I, I love the people. You know, it's a lot of fun. You go into a British bar during a soccer game or a football game, whatever you call it. And it's, it's super fun. Yeah, yeah. And people gamble. And they gamble recklessly. You know, it's like, you know, I'm drunk. I'm, I'm betting on Paris Saint-Germain. You know, Messi went there. You know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So your British companies bought in to and bought FanDuel, which is the number one sports betting app in the United States. It's a company called Paddy Power. It's based mm. in England. Paddy Power is yep. killing it, doing super well. And we can't own it in the ETF because it's a British company. Um, but they're doing very, very well. And I don't think the full value of that company 
is recognized because sports are back and soccer is getting bigger and bigger globally. You know, soccer has enormous potential, just enormous potential from a marketing perspective. You know, people in America have always mm. been forced on American football because it's American football, but we're a country of immigrants and people love soccer. And once soccer or football, whatever you want to call it, um, I say soccer because we have American football and people get confused. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Once soccer yeah. was put on TV here, like for real, people get up at like 5 a.m. and watch it, like in the bars too, because there's, you know, how many British people live in yeah. LA? Like, you know, how many Europeans yeah. live in America? You know, it's like, of course they love soccer and our soccer is decent at best. And so all of a sudden, you know, you've got this great industry. So mm -hmm. gambling is a great industry, you, you know, and, and for, in America, we've had a patchwork of gambling laws based off a bunch of ridiculous things for a long time. So originally you could only bet in Las Vegas, in, in Nevada. And then over the years, different States approved it, native American gaming, um, and but it was not legal federally that you could sports bet. So everybody was using sports betting apps and like Belize and stuff. And so uh, a couple of years ago, they just said this is a stupid law. Like federal, mm. you know, online gambling can happen if the states approve it. And so that's what's been happening. So it was approved on a federal level, but now each state is going through, and then like the patchwork of laws for each state is ridiculous. So yeah. now I think it's the opposite. Actually, as much as I'm bullish on online gambling, now everybody's in this business. You know, like. There's so much competition. So we actually don't have a, a lot of positions in this right now because okay, yeah. I actually think there's too many players now in the business. They're all spending tons of money. And the problem with gambling is people lose and they don't keep gambling. So you have degenerate gamblers who are the people who lose and keep gambling. And then you have mm -hmm. uh, responsible gamblers like me who will lose a certain amount of money and stop gambling. And the problem is, I reach that point and I stop betting on games because I just don't win, you know, like, so like mm -hmm. FanDuel and DraftKings says in the app that 80% of people lose 20% win in, yeah. uh, these, uh, what are they called? Fantasy sports betting. So, so 80% of people lose every day on DraftKings. How sustainable is that business? So, so gambling businesses have always yeah. functioned around comps. Like what do I give the gambler who loses so that they don't feel as bad? So in Vegas, you get rooms, you get food, you get entertainment. So like if you bet on the MGM app, which is where we have our investment, mm -hmm. um, you know, like you lose your money, at least you can go to Vegas, get a free room kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. and that's how gambling works. The comps are crucial. And what's happened is now the companies are giving out more in comps mm -hmm. than they make, you know? And so instead of it being a percentage of what they make in Vegas, it used to be 10%. So if you if you took in a thousand dollars from a gambler, you'd comp them back a hundred bucks, you know. And so like that was always sort of the Vegas ratio. Mm -hmm. But the way it works now is if you lose a thousand bucks, they comp you back like twelve hundred bucks. You know, it's like they'll do anything to keep you gambling because everybody wants to show rising gambling metrics and this and that. But there's only so many gamblers, and so this is going to be a more challenging consolidation stage, I think, because there's only so many people who are going to gamble on every game in March Madness and whatever. Most are casual gamblers like myself who might bet a, a couple hundred bucks a year at yeah. most. And so, you know, I think there's too many players in the, and we're going to see consolidation and there's no differentiation between the players other than what they can call. Yeah, okay. So that's that's part of the theme that you're kind of less bullish on now than perhaps you were previously. Well, how about the other right. side of the theme, which is... Cannabis kind of, is the opposite. Yeah, okay. Cannabis, I'm super bullish on. Never been more bullish couldn't believe, can't believe how undervalued, especially US MSO operators are that trade in Canada. Um, cannabis is different than gambling because it's like drinking. So we all have stressful lives between our kids and our jobs and we go home or, or let's say what the example, you're a British guy, you finish work, you go to the pub, you have a drink, you bet on a few games, but it was illegal to smoke cannabis. Okay. So if you went out into the alley and smoked the J with your friends and then came back and watched the second half of the game, that part was illegal. You could, you could drink and get in a fight, you know, you can gamble all your money away, but the part where you went out in the alley and smoked the J was illegal. It doesn't make any sense. Right. So that's ended because there's actually cannabis is much less harmful than alcohol and cigarettes. There's no reason why it's illegal other than it's what we call a Jim Crow law in the United States. 
There are laws used to oppress immigrants and minorities. And so um, back in the days of you know, post-slavery era in America, they wanted to create laws where they could jail African-Americans for no reason. Cannabis was an easy one, and it's been used this way throughout history. The British did the same thing. You know, in imperialist British governments would come up with laws in foreign countries and just jail people, you know, for ridiculous rules. You know, it, it, you know, it was tough if you were in some of these countries that the British occupied, you know, and, and you followed the rules or you're done. And so there's literally a, probably a million African-American black people in jail for no reason at all, just because they were selling or using cannabis. Um, so now cannabis is legal in most states or for medical or recreational. The federal government is now the big boogeyman here, just like holding back over whatever, but this is going to end. So we got the infrastructure bill this week and we're going to get the reconciliation bill over the next couple months. They want to get it done soon. Um, and then we move to cannabis. And this is about social equity and it's about reconciling the laws with reality and tax money, the money they can get in taxes. And so cannabis will be legalized in the United States very, very soon or decriminalized to some degree or deschedulized. And this will be a boon for the US uh, MSO, uh, multi-state operator cannabis companies, because sales are through the roof. The products are amazing. The marketing's amazing. Um, the stores are amazing. They've already built an amazing industry, whether it's Green Thumb or, or TerraSend or, uh, or uh, 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 True Leave in Florida. These are great businesses with great CEOs making tons of cash flow. And boy, you think out 10 years in this business, it'll be like a mature uh, alcohol business. So, you know, to me, this is one of the more obvious themes because um, as a cannabis smoker myself, I can tell you um, the benefits when it comes to stress and sleeping, especially sleeping, are huge. And you look at the pharmaceutical drugs people are taking today for stress and sleeping, and they're just super bad for people. So I, I think it'll be a big benefit for people in society to just have it be legal. Yeah, great. All right. Well, that's the theme to watch then. And I was going to ask you for a few uh, stock picks, but you mentioned a few interesting companies that I think our listeners can watch out for. Yeah. The other theme we're watching is the psychedelics. Okay. And yeah, uh, yeah. psychedelics is what we're watching closely. I think it's very early for this, but I do think that there is something to psychedelics in psychotherapies. And I do think tripping generally is good for people in li limited amount, maybe <laughs> not all people. Um, I, my personal experiences, I found it to be very, very beneficial when I was younger and did this. Um, granted they were at grateful dead shows. So maybe my perception was wrong, <laughs> but, um, it, I think there's a lot of psychological benefits to LSD, uh, if used correctly. And especially when you look at the mental health issues, so many people face what's the downside. Um, so I see, I see this happening but it's slower than cannabis. Yeah, okay. Great. All right. Well, I think that's a, a few interesting picks there to finish the main body of the interview on. Now, I ask all guests uh, a series of quickfire questions. So you can answer in as little as one sentence or even one word if you like. Shouldn't take more than two minutes. First question. In your opinion, what is the top mistake investors make? Hubris. We think we're smart. You know, we have a great month and, you know, you get whacked. Yeah. I think that's resonating with a few listeners. You, you know, I have a big ego. So, you know, nobody's going to argue Ross is this egoless guy who's so humble. I, they're just not going to argue that. I do. And I want to be right. Like, and there's nothing that pleases me more than being right about a stock. But the longer you pat your back, the more money you're going to lose patting it, you know? And, and, and that's the game. The game doesn't really mm. end. It, we do it annually, like it's every year is like a season, and and I want to win each season, and and I'm heck of competitive when it comes to my ETF because now it's like publicly, you know, tracked by and compared to everybody. Like I want to be like the best, you know what I mean? Mm. But I think if you start thinking that for too long, yeah, boy, you know, you're doomed. You're doomed. So I, you know, my wife and my partners here at, at work help me uh, remind me that I'm not that great constantly, and. So it's, it's helpful. And, uh, and I remind myself in the stock market's a horribly humbling place to. Yeah, know. no, absolutely. Okay, well, I've added this second question, one question in. It's not something that we ask everyone, but you're passionate about music. So which right. um, 
And it's something, unfortunately, we haven't had time to discuss today. But if you could pick a favorite artist or someone you're listening to a lot at the moment, could you recommend one for the listeners to watch out for? Well, I'm going to recommend two because I named my kids after artists. Mm -hmm. So my first kid's named Jimmy, spelled J-I-M-I. So Jimi Hendrix is, the, it's in my mind, the most influential artist, guitar player ever. Also spent a lot of time in England. Um, and thank God for the British because we wouldn't have had Jimmy without England being much more liberal than the United States in the early 60s. And all the great blues players played in England, actually. Um, the London music scene in 1965 was insane. Yeah. It was insane. Like you could walk into a bar with like the Rolling Stones, like Mick would be sitting there talking to Jimmy and Clapton would be in the back jealous that, you know, he wasn't playing or something, you know, like that was London in 1965. What an amazing place. And the Beatles were like big, you know? Yeah. Um, and my second son is middle name is Morrison for Jim Morrison. Yeah. And I think a lot of people underestimate how brilliant Ray Manzarek was as a keyboard player. And I don't cover a lot of door songs when I play uh, with my band because the keyboard parts are so amazing and I don't have a keyboarder that good. Mm -hmm. But we all think of Jim Morrison. We go, wow, Jim Morrison was, was such an innovator, songwriter, performer, musician. But actually that band would have never been that band without Ray Manzarek's keyboard playing. Um, so both my sons are named after a musician, um, Jim Morrison being one and Jimmy Hendrix being the other. Can never get enough. Great. All right. Question three. What's the most memorable moment from your career to date, do you think? Well, right now, it was ringing the bell in the stock exchange last month. You know, that was pretty cool. I, you know, I'm much more into music than finance, to be honest. Like, I got to hang out with Jimmy Buffett a couple of weeks ago, and I, I was like super pumped. He's, you know, a music legend, but also a business legend. And like, we got to hang out. I was actually the only audience member at a show because <laughs> this was a, a taping for my music <laughs> company is so much fun. I, I love music and being a part of that. Um, although it's not profitable, but uh, so when you talk about memorable moments in finance, ringing the bell in the New York stock exchange was one of it, but what was especially sweet was doing it with my partners that we all made it out there to do this. The, the core group of partners that I have here at the firm, we all got to do this together. It's, it's fun to accomplish things on your own, but it's, it's a lot more fun, you know, sharing it with others. So, so that was one of the highlights of my career. And I'm sure for them too, but like just all of us have been together for 11 years or more. Um, and, and to be able to, you know, I'm sure we all never thought, like, I, I wasn't a kid thinking, oh, I'll ring the bell exchange one day, you know? So that was pretty memorable. Um, in a, in, in, and that was just recently. So I, I would say that's one of probably the most special times, Mike. Yeah, definitely. Okay, penultimate question then. Let's go back in time. A top tip for your younger self. <laughs> you know, I always say youth is wasted on the young. I, I didn't invent this. My wife says it. I don't know where she got it from. And I find it so true. <laughs> When you're young, you worry about so many things that you don't need to worry about. Not that it's bad. Not that what you're thinking is wrong, but you're probably going to be okay. And so, like, don't miss out worrying about, like, everybody wants to live life so fast, get married fast, do this fast. I got to get to this point in life fast. But remember, the, the journey is part of the fun. Like, I didn't like being like broke and poor and 23 when I graduated college and my parents weren't going to give me money. And I was like, what do you mean you're not going to give me money? You know? And I was like, Oh God, you know? And now I look back on those times and I'm like, these were special times, you know? Like I look back on when I, I, I try to ask some woman out on a date and I had no money back then. And I would like try to pretend, you know, cause in LA it's like, everybody has money and, and these, you know, beautiful women are dating these rich old guys. And I'm like this 25 year old guy with no money. Right. You know? So it's like, you think back on those times with a lot of pleasure, actually, even though it was real painful, like having your, you know, refrigerator right next to your bed, like rumbling mm -hmm. all night, you know? So like when you're young, you face many different challenges, but it's also an amazingly great part of your life. So just embrace it, you know, because now when you're my age, you get a lot of positive in that I have financial security. I know what I want out of my life. I have what I want out of my life. I, I'm not striving, you know, like I did when I was 25 or 30, but then you don't have youth. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of sports and I'm sore all the time and it reminds me, you know, and I'm like, damn, you know, yeah, I'm never the sore at 35, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. All right. Well, I've got that to look forward to. Brilliant. Um, so final question then. And uh, unfortunately, we've got to go back to investments. We've got to finish on the investment message, I suppose. Um, and if I can ask, what is an investor's best source of alpha? So if you had to narrow it down to one thing, where do you think the great investors derive their outperformance? Pain. Pain. The most pain. painful times. The most horrible, horrific, painful loss time are when you drive the most alpha. It's, if you can, A, be in a position where you're not leveraged and you have capital to invest and it's real painful. It's real, real, real painful. That's when you make returns. That's when you make money. In times like this, when everything's going up and it's, you know, it's a bull market and, you know, it's fairly easy. You know, I try to do better relatively. You know what I mean? But where we really make money is if we can do a little bit better when things get tough and be in a position to buy when it's super painful to buy, that's when you make alpha. That's when you separate yourself. For us, it was 2000. 2000 was the year for us that was epic. And and that's where we created so much alpha between Tesla and our technology picks and avoiding 100% of the downside on the downside of Corona. We were only down 20 when the market was down 35. We had liquidity because we were in that position. We were able to buy. Um, we weren't aggressive even, but just we were able to buy. I, I'm not going to say we were aggressive. We were not. I was actually conservative. But because we were heavily invested in technology and Tesla, we had an amazing year. We derived you know, so much alpha in that one year. It like offsets a decade. You know what I mean? And so it's like true alpha is created through pain. It's when it's a real tough time to invest. It's really tough. And it can be company specific or it can be market specific or, or economic specific. And that's what makes this job hard. You know, and people can say, Ross, this, Ross, that. But until you've been through the pain I've been through and the financial crisis and dot com and COVID, um, I've been through some of the worst bear markets. I've been through 50, 60% declines in the stock market. And most of these people today don't know what pain is, you know? And so, you know, that's what I warn people in times like this. This is why you don't want leverage. This is why you want to hold cash. This is why you want to have a position because if markets get crappy quick, are you in a position to take advantage of? So pain, when you're feeling pain is when you have to act. And that's where you make alpha. And that is what makes this so damn hard. It's so hard to do. It's hard for me to, you know? I just know when I'm about to like crack and it like sucks, that's when I have to step in and buy. And it's just years of experience more than any emo- emotional underpinning. So your emotions serve you no value in investing. They just don't. Up and down. And that's what's so hard to do because you feel that pain, man. You feel it so hard and you got to just be like, wait, the PE ratio is now six. I got to buy Apple. You know, it's like, I remember buying Apple during the financial crisis, the only stock I bought, you know, but I was like, dude, it's Apple. Like I got to buy something, you know, I was happy about that. Yeah. So pain equals alpha. Yeah. All right. Really solid advice. And I think a really great message to end on actually. So let's leave it there. Thank you very much for joining me on the show, Ross. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's great. And I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, this might be of interest. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during the trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new products, stock reports, or webinars from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. And thanks also to CoFruition for consulting on and producing the show. Until next time. Co-fruition.